live on Facebook. Good evening, everyone, as uh, Dave would say if he was hosting, but he's lost that privilege because he completely, he completely bailed last week on yeah. having any sort of discussion. Uh, in fact, it was all of our faults. We all uh, were quite busy last week as we navigate our way through uh, these very emotional times. Personally, I discovered a really good uh, fried chicken place in my neighborhood, so uh, I was pretty occupied for quite some time. At least you're a light out of your but Welcome back again. Oh, of course. <laughs> That's what it is. This yeah. is it. I mean, as, as those of you who know me really well, I'm continuing on uh, trying to look like a secondhand action man um, <laughs> figure uh, during quarantine, so... Um, I am just trying to compete with Dave's stash. I'm just waiting to show oh. you the rest of this. But What's in other news, like? welcome back. Um, <clears throat> this week, we're talking about a really interesting topic, which is the Salonica campaign. And more specifically, we're going to be talking about some of the particularly Scottish voices from the Salonica campaign, as well as uh, just what was it? Um, we're joined again by three of my good friends. You've met Dave. And you've also met Rowan, but we're joined again by a Mr. Kieran. Uh, say hi to everyone. Hello. Kieran is also uh, a, a member of the Scots at War, uh, and um, he's an expert really on the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders and the units uh, from what is now the area around Strollingshire and the areas west of Glasgow, particularly Clyde Bank. So, um, we're going to be talking pretty heavily about them because that whole region is very heavily engaged with the Salonica campaign, as you'll find out. But I'm going to start asking questions really based on my limited knowledge of the campaign. I have a cursory knowledge, but I tend to focus more on the more interesting fronts, say the Western front, uh, agree. or the no, fighting in Palestine. No, 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 no. No, but no, but no, we no, do no. have <laughs> one of least living experts on the Salonica campaign. Yeah. At least in his neighborhood, he yeah. probably knows more than the other people. So Dave, than other people. Yeah. why were British soldiers in the First World War fighting in Greece against the Bulgarians? Well, how long have you got, really? Uh, obviously, uh, by the time that um, sort of August, September 1915 came around, uh, it became fairly clear that in the uh, in the Mediterranean theatre of war, uh, obviously that uh, the Ottoman forces had fought Britain uh, to a standstill, uh, and as a result of that, uh, we were in in some respects casting around for another theatre of operations which we could open up as a way of saying, well, you know, we're, at, we're you know we've not been beaten at Gallipoli, we're just deciding to tactically withdraw to the next large bay round in the Mediterranean. Uh, obviously, one of the main um, Parts of the campaign was actually to honor our obligations to our ally Serbia. Now, obviously, people, and this is certainly the way that uh, the First World War is taught in Scotland, there's a guy and he's from somewhere that's like Germany but not Germany, and he gets assassinated and it might, it's a Serbian or something, and then all of a sudden we're in the Battle of the Somme. So that's basically the way that uh, the First World War is taught uh, in Scotland, not in my classroom. Mother. Uh, but essentially, um, Serbia, uh, one of our sort of like our, our smallest and, and, and forgotten allies, uh, had been uh, invaded uh, by Bulgaria, and therefore uh, we decided to go to their aid. And as a result of that, had to land uh, in the uh, Greek port of Salonika. Uh, obviously, at this point, the government, uh, the Venezuelan government, uh, was pro. Uh, Entente powers, whereas the King Constantine was actually married to the uh, to the Kaiser's sister, so the monarchy was actually severely against uh, what was pretty much an illegal, uh, you know, uh, um, occupation of this port uh, of this port of Salonika. So therefore, we we forged up over uh, the the hills uh, into the Balkans to try and assist Serbia. Unfortunately, by the time that we got there, uh, we were far too late. Uh, Serbia had been overrun by that point, but we then couldn't just go, oh, well, yeah, this is totally pointless, let's leave. So we then had to sort of stay on. That's, so it, it always really interests me just to see, obviously, with Britain being 
brought into and engaging in combat, not only on the Western Front, but on a plethora of theaters around mm -hmm. the world. I mean, yeah. you very little about East Africa, you very yeah. little about Mesopotamia. It's really interesting here just how they ended up deciding to deploy combat troops to these areas. And yeah. I know we talked a little bit about Gallipoli in our second week live stream, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, was there any relation between the forces or, that were at Gallipoli and those who go to Salonika later? Who are we talking about? Who is at Salonika of the British troops? Uh, of the, well, um, obviously a lot of um, the French withdrawals, the, 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 the troops which are withdrawn from Gallipoli uh, in sort of September, October time are sent straight uh, to Salonika. And some of the first British troops uh, to land were actually the 10th Irish Division. Uh, so these uh, sort of like hardened uh, Gallipoli veterans are, uh, are, are dispatched into, uh, into Salonika and they're actually some of the first uh, British troops to land uh, there. Uh, where there is a whole host of new army divisions. Uh, there are a whole host of what you might call quite surprising regular Battalions, you know, for example, sort of the uh, the, the Royal Scots send the, the regular battalions there. Um, but, you know, for us, we're thinking Royal Scots, uh, we're thinking uh, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, of, of, of whom we'll hear more later, the Cameron Highlanders. Uh, we have the Cameronians uh, serving out there. And we also have yeomanry units such as the Scottish Force and uh, other units, you know, like subunits of units, uh, for example, the, uh, the Lothian and Borders Force Yeomanry. So, Quite a, an interesting representative spread of Scottish units as well, but the, the first boots on the ground um, were, were Irish lads of, of the 10th Division, hard in Gallipoli veterans. I, I know that you have some slides presented. Can we just see for visual representation the area we're talking about? Yeah, and let's and see. Power to... We can get that going. Okay, do okay. Uh, let's have a wee look then, chaps. So, um, we just take that up. Oh, sorry. Give me a moment. Excellent. So yeah, so you know, a lot of people say, you know, what what even is a Salonica sort of thing? So essentially, uh, this is uh, the port of Salonica here, and uh, we essentially fought our way up uh, over the border into Serbia uh, at the tail end of 1915. And uh, unfortunately, British troops uh, were defeated and they were more or less chased back over the border. And uh, as a result of that, um, we found ourselves uh, occupying uh, not only the port of Salonika, uh, but this entrenched uh, line here across uh, to Stavros. But essentially, the, the, the main British areas of uh, deployment were the Vardar Valley and uh, the Struma Valley. And uh, essentially, as you can see from the map here, it was very, very uh, mountainous territory. And the first uh, movements after the British had been chased back uh, into Salonika was then to sort of uh, force their way forwards and, and construct something called the Bird Cave, uh, which was a series of defences not only to stop the Bulgarians uh, invading Greece and attacking the British, but also as, as, as like a, a system of redoubt in case the, the dubious loyalty of the Greeks at the start of the war anyway, uh, it just in case that that loyalty sort of flipped and we then more or less found ourselves besieged uh, in Salonika. So that, you know, it was very, very touch and go at the start of the campaign. So uh, in the Vardar Valley, uh, we have uh, 26th Division, 22nd Division, um, and these units are, are largely rotated through there. Uh, through the Struma Valley, that's usually occupied by the 28th Division, uh, with the 10th Division on lines of communication and uh, the 27th Division further down here. And it's actually uh, very, very interesting that a lot of the major roads between, for example, Salonika and Serech here, uh, these roads were actually built by the Royal Engineers <laughs> in, the, in, in the Salonika in the, in the campaign because there was, you know, we are in the wilds of nowhere. We are on map references <laughs> a lot of the time. Very, very sort of like mountainous territory. Uh, and obviously between the mountains, uh, baking hot malarial valleys uh, in the summer. So very, very uh, difficult theater of warfare in which uh, to, to fight. Yeah, this always fascinates me as well as the, the battles that you see the British Army engaging in in mm -hmm. Eastern Mediterranean or you, I, you don't really read about these places in history books unless you're reading about the British Army and the French engaged in 19... Yeah. 
15 to 1918 or like Xerxes invasion of, of Greece. Yeah. Like these are places that I, I think a classical historian would recognize or a first world war historian. But yeah, I mean, one of the, the, unless you're a Balkan it, specialist yeah. <laughs> outside of that, it's yeah. Um, one of the most incredible things about the, uh, the British Salonica force as it, uh, as it became known was that it actually had its own attached archeological unit. That's incredibly crazy. enough, you know, that when these chaps are, are, are digging up uh, the, 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 you know, the trenches and these redoubt lines, uh, they, they find all sorts of incredible uh, archaeological treasures. There's a series of wonderful photographs, and I think Rome might be able to help me out with this one. I think it's the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and uh, you know, yeah, these, you know, these chaps are actually holding up like a Roman tombstone yeah. that they've dug up. Quite incredible. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So as we're looking at these units, you know, uh, I'm going to switch over a bit to Kieran for a second. Is yeah. there any, like, you, I know you want to talk about the Argyles. <laughs> what was it experience like for not only a battalion that's serving in, in the Salonica Theater, but specifically a Scottish battalion? Um, well, Scottish battalions, I mean, one in particular, the Argyles, the 12th battalion, it was quite hard. Uh, they took part in an engagement around an area known as the Tongue. Uh, with uh, the Royal Scots Fusiliers and also nearby the 11th Cameronians. Um, the 12th Argyles, pretty much at the end of that engagement, ended up losing around 50% of their number, which is quite a high number of losses as well, considering like going from the Gallipoli campaign as well, some of the losses that were there. So it was quite harsh, considering like at the same time, the Serbian forces had managed to push back the enemy 20 miles, whereas the Scottish forces around that area had pretty much ended up near enough in another stalemate. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, well, it, so that, that brings <clears throat> up an interesting point. You know, this experience of combat is different everywhere. And we, I know we hear a lot about Gallipoli and a lot about the Western, but as a question for all three of you, what was that experience? How did the experience of combat in the Salonica front differ from the stereotypical experience you would see through the war on the Western front? And importantly, as we know now, the Western front changed. So did that experience in the Salonica front change at all, uh, that fighting experience? Um, I mean, go on, uh, Kevin, go for a minute. No, no, go. Well, it's actually just, just uh, you know, going on from the, from the point that Kevin's made there. You know, one of the things is that they just, there are no replacements. You know, once once these battalions are worn down, there are, there are no replacements, you know, and, and this is the thing, certainly in, in 1917, uh, with the uh, submarine threat uh, in the Mediterranean, with the submarine threat in the Aegean, you know, essentially leave is canceled. So there are no troops really going away uh, from the uh, Salonica front. And there's, there's, there's nothing by way of reinforcements coming in. And this is one of the things like the British commander, General Milne, uh, just is, is, is constantly sort of saying like, well, we literally cannot do anything because we simply don't have the men to do it. And this is what, you know, this is really one of the heartbreaking things that once these battalions are, you know, they're, they're reduced down to 500 men and then they're thrown into action again and they're down to 300 men. And, it, and you know, it's this, this constant uh, trickle away of, uh, of casualties as well uh, to, to climate and disease. Uh, apart really from uh, the Mesopotamian theater of war and uh, maybe East Africa, you know, entire regiments are destroyed by the climate and the disease uh, in, in Salonika. You know, it, I think it, it's something like 75% of combat effective men have malaria. And there's, there's nothing that can be done about that. They just have to carry on. You know, whereas if you were on the Western Front, if you if you were if you were ill, you know, you'd be in a hospital, you'd probably be home, you know, within 48 hours, 72 hours. That's just not the case in Salonica. You know, the Salonica force went on and on until it was more or less ground out of existence. You know. That's really interesting. You showed me uh, some photos beforehand of troops specifically mm -hmm. suffering from sunburn. Yeah, yeah. that were really interesting because you know that's one major difference between fighting in Northern France or even the UK is the sun exists here. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Salonica. So it's, uh, yeah. You know, if we have a look at this, this is a, a lovely uh, picture from early on in the campaign. A lot of people think, well, was these Australian guys out there? No. What 
one of the uh, one of the, one of the sort of real features of uh, the Salonica front was shortages. And instead of being uh, equipped with sort of like what you might call the, you know, the Wolseley pattern pit helmets, the chaps are essentially kitted out in what we uh, associate as uh, Australian slouch hats. But they weren't, they were obviously, you know, these were worn by uh, English regiments, Welsh regiments, you know, you name it. So the chaps are uh, walking their way through the valleys uh, in, in 40, 45 degree heat, whereas come October, November time, you're in 10 10 foot deep of snow, you know, and you really don't get that climactic variation anywhere else. And yeah, obviously uh, the, the winter of 1916 into 17 uh, was, was, was brutally cold on the Western Front. But this is, this is the experience of the British Salonica Force every winter. You know, when you are, as it was called, up country in the Vardar Valley, in the Struma Valley, this is what, you know, you, you, you are in. You're, you're in tents in 10 foot deep snow. <laughs> Quite incredible, really. You know? Yeah. Also, if we just add for that, add to that, just the general um, principles of how they actually are fighting and holding the front line in Salonica, and mm -hmm. um, it's actually quite similar to what I studied primarily, primarily in terms of 1914, in that mm -hmm. the obviously you said there there are a set number of, uh, of of men there. Effectively, you can't replace battalions easily, and so that leads to effectively a battalion could be spread over a frontage of several miles and that in terms of the yeah. of yeah. the uh, tactics of the time it is just ridiculous that w where's the line so thin yeah. that enemy breakthroughs are really easy and it's mm -hmm. you know it's almost reminiscent of what we see after Mons um, between Mons and the Ain mm -hmm. uh, in 1914 it's really um, it's that they keep that up for three years <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah, yeah it, it is really different and, and, and to this is where, you know yeah and also you have, there are spaces in Salonica where it can be miles and miles of no man's land where, and with mountains in yeah, between, miles, which you don't have, miles, quite in, yeah, which you don't have in, uh, in, in Flanders. So it is just a completely different mm -hmm. uh, theatre of war. It's a completely different way of understanding warfare in the period. What's, it's it's very interesting from the point of view of um, that you know the, the way that sort of like these isolated garrisons and outposts are held, it almost sort of presages some of the later um, fighting on the Western Front, where we actually start to trust the fact that we could send a sergeant and six men onto the top of a hill with a Lewis gun and quite you know <laughs> quite comfortably hold a huge amount of men back you know, all day long with it sort of thing. So we often see sort of like this, this large scale um, devolvement of a command down onto, um, onto, onto junior officers and then onto senior NCOs and then down to relatively small amounts of, of men where, where, where essentially they're letting the, the, the technology do the talking for them, which is something that, you know, only begins to uh, develop maybe a little bit later on on the Westerns. Yeah, because our the tactics of trench of, of the way that trench warfare is kind of set up have effectively evolved from the open warfare tactics of 1914 mm -hmm. where you have a firing line and outposts and standing patrols and tactical reconnaissance which then become trench lines listening posts trench raids effectively um but i think it really is in salonica that lessons start to be learned and new you know new ideas taken which then manifest themselves across all the fronts definitely well, I, interesting, and I know Dave mentioned earlier about who was sent to Salonica. Um, two divisions that particularly interest me because one of them has a pretty heavy Scottish uh, presence in the 27th and the 28th divisions. 28th particularly for the very heavy Scottish presence. I believe it was the 28th with the uh, uh, Scottish Brigade in it, the Cameronians, Argyles, Royal Scots Fusiliers. Um, but the, um, these are two divisions that had seen action on the Western Front throughout most of 1915. They were, uh, 27th was very heavily engaged at Luce. They were the ones who came in just behind the 9th Scottish Division, who we talked about the first week. Um, but they weren't really rated as one of the best divisions. In fact, they were kind of black sheep of the BEF. Uh, and so there, there's interesting reasons that these men were not learning that they were sent to Salonica. And then all of a sudden, the, in these situations, they turn out to be pretty cracked divisions under <laughs> under pretty strenuous circumstances. Yeah. Um, which I think is really interesting. And, and we also have really awesome photographs, actually, of what some of the action looked like. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
the, uh, the the thing here is, you know, so you know, we were talking about sort of like the experience of Salonica, and obviously the the campaign was actually widely derided at the time because it, you know it was a case of well, what are these guys doing out there? It just looks like they're they're sitting about. Well, of course, this is sort of like where East uh, you know meets West. This is a, a, a lovely picture outside one of the main cafes uh, in, in in Salonica town here, and there was this unfortunate sort of uh, idea that the British Salonica force spent most of its war sitting about, you know, on the tops of trenches or, uh, you know, drinking beer or all the rest of it, but it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, there's all like these um, um, stuff. I've got Mrs. Clark holding up at the time, but what she doesn't know is, come in, just come in, come on, tell everybody. What she doesn't know is that we're actually going to do a special on the Scottish Women's Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After that, from uh, from Mrs. Clark, um, you know, the, the, there's sort of like these these big moments in the campaign uh, that everybody sort of seems to remember. The day that the uh, the Zeppelin is brought down over the harbour, uh, the day that actually the uh, the vast majority of the town burns down, uh, there is a, 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 an old lady baking bread, which essentially uh, burns most of the city of Salonica to the ground. And these are the things that grab the headlines. Uh, these are the pictures of uh, the, the the gardeners of Salonica, the so so the, the so called uh, uh, picnic uh, experience of out there in the sun. What they don't see are you know these sorts of photographs. That you know this is this is a cookhouse in Salonica, uh, and I believe that these uh, are the Argyles. Perhaps um, Karen would be able to to jump in and help us on that one. But you you wouldn't see this in France. You know a cookhouse which is made out of sticks and a tarpaulin. You know, like the, the, the scenes that are, are seen are, are, are incredible. You know, this, this is a rest camp in Salonica. There's, there, there are no cinemas, there are no theatres, there are no amenities, there's nothing, you know? And uh, now these definitely are uh, the, uh, the Argyles. So one of the things that amazes me here is just, you know, just the level of sunburn <laughs> that these lads are, uh, are having to put up with. And of course, the daily parades uh, to take quinine uh, for uh, the, the mosquito infections and uh, and all that sort of caper. So the the, the fighting, uh, you know, as we were saying, is incredibly, incredibly hard. This is a frontline trench in Salonica, and obviously, as as Rowan will tell you, that you haven't seen this sort of stuff since 1914. <laughs> you know, like like tiny like shell scrapes, guys just digging in, uh, holding uh, a frontage. Uh, with their rifles there. So we have full-on trench warfare in Salonica, which has all of the attendant horrors of the Western Front, all of uh, the artillery uh, attacks, all of the chemical weapons that are used. But this is sort of like the, the, the level of technology that's being used in the trenches. There's, there's, there's not a scrap of crinkly tin. Uh, you know, the trenches can't be properly revetted. Uh, in, in some cases, you know, the trenches are actually dug into, into solid rock. Uh, nothing by way, really, of communication trenches. Not much by way of barbed wire. Uh, communication, often by heliograph, little by way of telephone. Uh, these are extremely primitive uh, field fortifications. And, you know, these chaps are holding off, uh, you know, heavy artillery, uh, poison gas attacks, you name it. Quite, uh, quite incredible. But that's, that's, that's the nature of the war, uh, sort of in the Vardar Valley, in the Struma Valley, as, as uh, Rowan was saying, that the front lines could actually be miles and miles apart. So there was a continual round of raiding and patrolling, uh, which was actually done in, in some cases by cavalry, you know, sort of on horseback. So it's another interesting sort of echo of the Western Front that these small scale raids uh, that you see on the Western Front are, are big deals uh, over in Salonica. And, and this is quite an incredible picture uh, showing troops going into action in one of these raids. Um, you know, the, the amount of genuine photographs of British troops in action in the First World War is pretty limited, uh, but this is, a, this is supposedly one of them. But, you know, the, the difficulties that the troops are facing out there are, are, are quite incredible. You know, to, to force their way through the Balkan mountains through ranges like this with very, very limited uh, field artillery, often light mounting guns and strictly rationed uh, ammunition. 
So, you, you know, the, the bombardments that you would see on the Western Front lasting a week, nine days, they're lasting at best one or two, three days, and uh, not doing much by way of <laughs> damage at times. So that, you know, so when the troops go into action, as, as Kieran was saying, it's often very much foot slogging up an open mountainside into, into, in, into the face of very well organized Bulgarian defenders. And uh, the Bulgarians themselves were exceptionally formidable fighters, uh, especially in defense. Quite, quite a different um, experience to the Western Front in terms of the fact that everything is done on a shoestring. You know? that, that's something which I think makes all of these accounts from Salonika really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and to that end, are there any specific accounts? Uh, I know we have a specific poem we're going to cite here. Um, if, uh, including that poem, uh, <clears throat> Does anybody want to recommend any specific accounts to point people towards when discussing or, or just for a good introduction to what it was like to be in Salonika, um, including the poem itself? In many respects, where there's actually been very, very little um, that's been written on uh, the Salonika campaign recently. The standard place where, if, you know, if you wanted to sort of get into Salonika, uh, you know, as I have, deeply in. Uh, you should um, find yourself a copy of Under the Devil's Eye uh, uh, by Alan Moody, which is essentially like the, the best single volume uh, account. Uh, there's actually a really, really good uh, um, PhD thesis uh, released recently called No Sideshow, um, which is a, you know, an exceptionally accessible way into the Salonika campaign, which really reevaluates this idea that the British troops were simply sitting about for, for three years when Really, they weren't. <laughs> so, so let's talk about specifically. Obviously, poetry plays a large part on the Western Front in terms of memory of the First World War. Rowan, let's talk about the, uh, the the poem specifically for this week that discusses Salonika. Yeah. So this isn't your average war poetry. This is something that I'll let Dave talk on in quite a lot more detail. He's more familiar with it than I, I think. <clears throat> but uh, yes, the song of Tiadatha or Tiadatha is. 144 pages long. It's an epic poem. It is uh, based on, is it a medieval one? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the Song of Hiawatha. It's a Longfellow's, it's, it's, it's basically a spoof of, a, a, of an earlier epic poem. So, yeah. but, but what's really surprising about it is um, it's, it's written by Owen Rutter, who was an officer in, uh, sorry, I've already forgotten what regiment he was in. Seventh Wiltshire's. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so he it basically talk, it's not specifically his war service. It's a little bit, I think, taken from some of his mates as well. But it uh, documents the experience of an officer going through joining up, training, going to the Western Front, and then going to the Salona, going to the Salonica Front afterwards, uh, which is really interesting because we get a good comparison between the two uh, between the two fronts. It reads quite similarly to the first hundred thousand. <clears throat> except that it's in this form as a poem. Uh, but once you kind of get used to reading it, it effectively just feels like reading prose, like exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. And from what we know about the general experience of the life of officers um, and what it was like on these fronts, I think we can say with reasonable surety that it is pretty accurate. I mean, yeah. and even just some of the little bits, like he talks about getting his kit, getting a, getting a sword made by the son of Wilkin, like anyone who's... Yeah. <laughs> got a sword from the time it will probably be made by Wilkinson's it's these little things that he puts in it that uh, really kind of describe the experience so well uh, but particularly he talks about these about going on one of these raids that uh, that they've uh, as mentioned um, and it's obviously a very big part of his uh, experience on the front because otherwise I think there's only one other attack in this whole account of the war pretty much and yeah. uh, they don't have a lot of contact with the Bulgarians not even as on the like on the Western Front, you would quite often be bothered by snipers. That doesn't happen all that much because he's talking about the lines being miles and miles apart. Um, he also talks about the living conditions in Slonica, which <coughs> excuse me, were sound from his account even worse than on the Western Front. And he struggles to make himself a dugout and a place to sleep and things, and then a few days later he gets moved and has to leave it behind and things like that, you know. It's a uh, yeah, yeah, Dave, if you want to take it any further than that, I don't know what else you can remember from it. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea of uh, uh, the song of Tayadasa was that it was, it, it actually uh, originally came out uh, in, in sort of like a serialized form in a, in a trench newspaper called uh, Balkan News. And it really became uh, this, this, um, this epic poem really became uh, rather than a series of sort of like, you know, of an individual's memories, more of a, a peen of praise and a peen of thanks to the men of the British Salonika force. And there are constant references uh, all the way through the poem. There's actually a, a highly, uh, highly effective and, and a highly affecting um, introduction uh, to the poem, where it essentially says, we're the British Salonika force. If you weren't in Salonika, you couldn't understand what it was like, you know, and you know, as a simple case of yeah, you 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 know, you you were on the Western Front and the bombardments were incredible. You you had bombardments, you you endured bombardments, but at least you had bombardments before you had to attack, you know. And yeah, the trenches were wet and muddy, but you had bats behind the line, you had regular mail, you, you even had things like leave. You know, it, it's far from uncommon for a man to be sent to the Salonika front in 1916 and only return from it uh, in 1918 when, when, they were, when they were being withdrawn from Salonika to, to, to be sent to the Western Front. So it was quite, quite common uh, for a man to be sent uh, into that theatre of war and be there for two years, three years with no home leave. Very, very... Um, irregular access to letters and things like that. So essentially this, uh, the song of Tiadatha by uh, Major Owen Rutter, it's, it, it's there as a lot of it is like a big witting in joke about the campaign. And the, the whole idea of it was to almost exclude those people that hadn't had you know, what might be called the Salonica experience, the freezing snows of winter being washed out of the trenches in in springtime by the snow melt the baking 40 degree heat in summer <laughs> and it is, it's essentially a, a, a lovely sort of clannish um in joke about about a lot of the things that went on in salonica that if essentially you weren't there you just wouldn't know about it, it wouldn't matter to you you, would, you wouldn't know about that and i think really sort of like there's a wonderful um like Comrades Association, which, which grows up around the British Salonica force, because essentially these lads had to look after themselves because nobody else was looking after them, you know? So, uh, you know, sometimes I've heard it called like the British Cinderella force. You know, they, they were sort of like, uh, they never, never got to go to the ball sort of thing, never, never ever made it to the headlines of the papers and, and things like that. So this is essentially a lovely way of, of gathering together veterans and sharing these experiences which are utterly unique to the men uh, of the British Salonica Force. And, and it's, it's almost sort of like this inverted snobbery of, well, you know, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't understand because you weren't there. We were there because we were BSF men. You know, and it, it's just beautiful. So, so good. Yeah. That, I think this book carries, in, uh, carries on a really strong tradition not only in British military history, but in all military history of saying, well, you know, we were there, you weren't. It doesn't matter if a regiment was at a battle with higher casualties, if they weren't at this other battle, you know, they would be made fun of. And it's really strong with the regiments in the British Army who are at Waterloo and who weren't at Waterloo. Yeah. Um, and you see that for years after the, the, the fact of the battle. Um, it, 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 this really interests me because it brings up another idea which I try to hit on every single one of the live streams and that's if you're walking down the street in Scotland or in the rest of the United Kingdom today what can you see and what marks uh, would you notice uh, that are directly resulting from uh, British partic participation in the Salonika force you know um, these could be things from war memorials to battalion headquarters. I know we talked about walking past various memorials in Edinburgh and Glasgow and cemeteries, but, but what really got you interested in Salonika? And what can people walking down the street when the quarantine is over see that can help them connect to Salonika? Yeah, I just want to sort of add a little bit on this. Like, there's even things that you wouldn't expect. Like at my university, the University of Dundee, there's a bit sort of on the Perth Road where the university sort of ends and the town begins. There's a sort of a 
wall fenced off area of grass and it's not actually fenced off anymore because another impact of the war they nicked the railings in the second world war to melt them down but uh, this patch of grass has been left and it's because it used to have a bulgarian field gun captured in salonica on it uh, as a war memorial uh, unfortunately it was melted down in the 1930s but uh, yeah just little things like that you wouldn't even expect something i didn't know about until a few weeks ago really but uh, yeah, there are, the Salonika has impacts everywhere in ways that you wouldn't expect. Kieran, what got you into the Argyles in Salonika? Uh, well, one of my relatives uh, was in the one fifth Argyles. Uh, they were pretty much at Gallipoli. They weren't really at Salonika. Well, they weren't at Salonika. But, um, <clears throat> so, learning about past family history, as a lot of people do through uh, school work or looking that up themselves or whatnot pretty much is the same way that a lot of people get into it uh, past relatives that's pretty much why i started researching and get, even getting into reenactment as well uh, my father was in argyle but that was 70s 80s mm-hmm. <laughs> so i had a family connection with the regiment there as well also where i'm from uh Clyde bank itself is like a bit like a no man's land i'm between glasgow and dumbarton uh, so I've got like Cameroonians, HLI, Royal Scots, Fusiliers, Argyles and pretty much in like, a massive melting pot of regiments. So it's a great area to pretty much open up horizons to different units that were there. But myself, yeah, it's pretty much through family history that I started getting interested into the side of the Argyles in all conflicts through the First World War, Second World War as well. And uh, the man himself, Mr. Clark. What, what really drew you to Salonika, and how do you notice the impacts uh, today? Well, b- bizarrely enough, the thing that uh, drove me to, to Salonika was exactly the same thing that Kieran was saying. Uh, many, many, many years ago, like 25 years ago now, I was, uh, I was walking through um, a, a local cemetery, as one does, um, with my father, and he said, that grave there, that was my granddad's grave. I said, all right, okay. And, uh, you know, I just said, what was he like? Um, and he said, oh he, was, oh, he was an incredible man. He was a tiny little fella. He used to go bright yellow and eat coal. And I was like, you know, because my dad was, was a constant, like, wind-up merchant. It was like, why well, go bright yellow and why? <laughs> and obviously my, my um, great-great-grandfather, Isaac, Isaac Belfield, who was a gunner there, um, he had recurring bouts of debilitating malaria all the way through his life uh, as a result of his service there. And also, God bless him, because I've seen his, uh, his, uh, his service records, he also contracted amoebic dysentery um, whilst in Salonika. Now, these are things that would see you, like, out of the Western Front, just gone, you know, like, off you go home. But uh, incredibly, he was, he was actually still in the front line, you know, he's still in the artillery lines, suffering from severe malaria and amoebic dysentery. And obviously the malaria, you know, accounted for the fact that he would, uh, he would turn bright yellow. But uh, the eating a coal, believe it or not, uh, was something that was actually uh, prescribed to the troops out there. And, you know, hope you've, all, uh, hope you've all had your dinner sort of thing, because essentially they would take pieces of coal, uh, pound it up into sort of like, like a fine silty grit, and then drink it as a, sort of like swirl it around it in water to drink. And the idea being that the extra grit was there in the stomach to sort of like try and basically make the dysentery easier to pass and sort of like scrape the intestines out basically. And he essentially still carried on with this cure right the way up until the mid 1950s when, when, he, when he died. <laughs> so I think, so I, I, you know, that's incredible. So my experience of, of learning about the First World War as a child wasn't really anything to do with guys in the Western Front with, you know, gas masks and tin helmets. It was my great granddad Isaac with his shorts and his pith helmet on going bright yellow and, you know, eating coal to try and, <laughs> to try and relieve his dysentery sort of thing. So from there, it, it, just, it just went on from me, you know. And I often found, you know, when I, when I started to get into this campaign, that personally for me, it's far, far more interesting than the fighting on the Western Front because you know, there's a greater uh, involvement um, with British forces and French troops, Russian troops, 
uh, Greek troops, uh, Italian troops, and, and much of the um, much of the actions were on a much smaller scale, which for me, as I was sort of like growing up, were much easier to get a handle on. You know, in, in terms of you know, th this is an action that maybe only contained a couple of divisions rather than you know, several army corps. So I think you know, so the smaller scale of the warfare uh, actually really really appealed to me because to me there's almost sort of like like the overtones of like uh, the scale of the engagements in the Boer War and sort of like colonial warfare as well, you know, much smaller scale, low intensity periods of, of rest and then high intensity combat, but fairly infrequently. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, I, I agree with all of you guys. That it's those, those main themes that really got me interested. Mm -hmm. And again, I need, it's a, a theater that I don't know as much as I should about. <laughs> and I, I would like to know more about it. Particularly, uh, I don't have family who served in the British Army, but I uh, have always been very passionate about the Cameroonians and their 11th Battalion, obviously, <laughs> having served there. But when I started taking French classes uh, in college, uh, one of the movies we had to watch was a movie called Captain Conan, which was a French action movie, like very action-y movie about a, an officer in 1918 in Salonika. Um, and it's a great film. If you haven't seen it, you can find it online with English subtitles. It was made maybe late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, but it was always kind of fascinating for me to, to see these different fronts, these different theaters. And while I would debate the more interesting than the Western front. Um, for me personally. I do think there's a higher concentration of interesting characters. Uh, on the Salonica front. And I don't want to steal the thunder of another amazing historian who you briefly saw on screen tonight, but we'll hear a bit about the Scottish Women's Hospital and oh, yes. hospital <laughs> later, um, <laughs> later. But there are some other, you know, just the amount of volunteers who are there. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I, I still live in the United States as of right now. Um, we're working but, on that, Jim. We're working on it. We're working on it. It's not advanced. When I, when I attend the living history events that are here in the States, particularly in Newville and Pennsylvania, I'm always reminded that this would be much more like a Salonica than the Western Front because we've got tall grass, mosquitoes. We generally make ourselves sick, but that's more alcohol related than yeah. temperature. Uh -huh. um, and you've got a wide mix of nationalities. And, and I, I do think that this is a, a period and a, and a theme of the First World War, which is really interesting to teach people about if they would be willing to listen to it because it doesn't mm -hmm. follow the traditional story but it is it is an international story and it is a story that represents uh peoples that you wouldn't traditionally hear about uh, yeah. <laughs> from across the world uh you know all kind of fighting together against the bulgarians mm -hmm. which uh you also don't hear much about so um i think we're probably going to be revisiting some salonica topics um, and some other Balkan theater and, and, and Far Eastern front topics. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to say before uh, Mr. Clark is, is shifted off? Well, I was going to... Uh, oh, oh, we'll, we'll do Scottish Women's Hospital on, a, on, on another um, thing on another time. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that, that's, uh, that's an hour in itself. That's incredible stuff. Yeah. I was going to bring up after we talked a wee bit about the, the poem about just sort of... Um, officer life in the front but actually i think we could we could do an hour on that separately to yeah. be honest quite easily so i think we're probably this is going to be a continuing series and what's great about that is if we've had plenty of people watching if there's any topics that you would love uh, to see covered regarding the salonica campaign or any other scottish related first world war topics please let us know um we're we're definitely going to continue on with this um for the uh, foreseeable future um, and and again we will be revisiting stay tuned for our discussions for next week and always feel free to reach out through the Facebook page um, and and we will get back to you very shortly Rowan show off the brand new feather bonnet oh yeah do that man. bring off the place down look, yeah, at, that. look at that look at that he made that, that. Yeah. All yeah. from his own head. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it needs the dice ban, but that'll be Kieran's one because we're going to have a lot of uh, pre war public order duties uh, events going on. We're working with some other reenactment groups when we eventually yeah. get out of lockdown. Yeah. I'm going to feel dirty doing Black Watch instead of our Gale. So. 
But we will uh, also be posting a link to the books we mentioned, specifically Under the Devil's Eye, which... Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a belter. And, you know, that is... You, know, you often see it written on the front of books. Ooh, this book is unput down. This is literally unput downable. It is, ab you know, an absolutely incredible uh, history, not only in military history, but political history. And for me, uh, you know, the most uh, fascinating chapters are the way that people, you know, live their lives, you know, in the Salonica Front. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely I'd like to mention another uh, book. Well, I just, I just generally what I think we should mention it, Jim, the uh, book, which I don't know what the title of, because we didn't have a working title for it, uh, that we've both contributed to being written primarily by uh, Fraser Brown and Derek Patrick, is going to have a, a section on it, uh, in it, on the 10th Black Watch at, uh, in Salonica, written mm -hmm. by um, Ronnie Proctor, Major Proctor of the X Black Watch, um, which promises to be quite interesting. So when we eventually have the final title for that, uh, we could put that up as well. Yeah, especially anything involving members uh, will definitely be getting a shout out and possibly even their own episode. Um, that way we can run past our gibberish to a general public. So, <laughs> Well, with that in mind, thanks a lot, guys. Dave, I'm going to ask for host back so I can end yeah. the live session. Let's, uh, um, let's do that. Um, how, how does one do this? And we want to especially thank Kieran for coming out. If you want to get a similar effect to um, what it was like to have dysentery in Salonica, you can visit Greg's. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, just, yeah. uh, just ask Hamish. Um, obviously, yeah. when we were out in France during our march last year, he got... Uh, yeah, it's, it's bad news. Yeah, bad it's, news. Yeah, try not. Uh, please stay safe, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, and we'll see you all next week.